Um, for this session, we're going to be talking about virtual machine viewers as a way to enable uh, open simulator access on mobile devices, as well as on low computing devices. Um, our speakers today are two colleagues of mine, Jason Lorino and Chris Vimeur, and I'm Kay McLennan. Jason is a systems administrator and professor at Tulane University. Chris is also a systems administrator at Tulane University. And uh, many of you know me uh, already. I'm a professor of practice and director of online learning at Tulane School of Professional Advancement. So let's get started. I'm going to set up the um, uh, user end user view of the use of virtual machine software, and then I'm going to turn it over to my more able colleagues to give you more of an overview of virtual machine software and a virtualized viewer. Um, as uh, my colleagues know that, let's see, I'm having an issue here. Let me start. Again, I'm not seeing anything up on the board, but I'll, I'll imagine that it's changing even though I can't see it. Um, it. There are viewer limits on student use or access to Open Simulator. Uh, one of the limitations is that mobile devices, whether it's an iPhone, uh, an iPad, or any uh, similar touchscreen, um, will not display the Open Simulator viewer and it can't be used on these devices. Um, another limitation is how Chromebooks uh, cannot be used to download and install the Open Sim uh, viewer. Um, and then there's no guarantee that our students are going to have a, or be using a computer that is capable of actually running the Open Sim viewer from the standpoint of the, their available RAM or graphics card. And then finally, students may be reluctant to download uh, just a third party viewer uh, because it's unknown to them and it's not available on the institution's website. So uh, virtual machine software to the rescue. Um, the VMware uh, Horizon um, that uh, our systems administrators used is just something to be downloaded onto your device or laptop. Um, and of course, for uh, it's available either from uh, the iTunes store or, uh, you know, whatever the Google, I can't think of the name right off the top of my head. But once the VMware is downloaded onto your device or computer, uh, you click on the uh, icon, item number one on the screen now. Um, next, uh, click on add the uh, client, the server. Uh, number three, you enter the name of the server. And then number four uh, is just clicking on the server when you're ready to go online. And uh, this is uh, two screenshots from my uh, iPhone 6. Um, I only have uh, one of the small iPhones, but you can see the green uh, VMware logo up on the upper right-hand corner of the, of the screen. And then when I launch it, you can see on the right-hand side how uh, Singularity Viewer and the Firestorm Viewer are available for me to use on my iPhone. Um, this is a screenshot of me in, using the Firestorm Viewer on my iPhone 6. I can move around. Um, I can, you know, the resolution is quite good, as you can see, the depth of field. Um, I will confess, and this is the first time I've tried it on my iPhone, um, I was not able to use Singularity uh, to log in because if you remember where the uh, text boxes are for Singularity at the bottom of the screen, for some reason, I just couldn't get the little text to go right in there. And I, I'm not claiming that it's easy to use on an iPhone uh, with the little text boxes but it does work, and that's just a, an absolutely amazing development to me. Um, 
the next screen uh, I have is uh, of uh, about an eight-year-old uh, iPad with, it might be the second uh, generation iPad that it has a smashed up screen in the upper left hand corner, but it worked with this device too. So that was absolutely amazing to me. Um, so in summary, I'm gonna again, turn it over to Jason next. A major advance in accessibility uh, is possible through the use of virtualized viewers. However, I'm going to open this up to the group of uh, capable developers and users that we still need a single sign-on from learning management systems like Canvas. I know I sound like a broken record, but um, there we have it. Um, I'm detaching uh, my slides now, and I am going to start Jason's slide. Jason, I'm going to turn it over to you, and uh, please tell me when to advance the slides. Thank you, Kay. I appreciate it. Um, okay, so um, first of all, of course, uh, let me say thanks uh, for allowing us to come and uh, speak at the event. And uh, so I'm going to start a little bit and, and start with the scenario and how we came to develop these virtual uh you know these viewers in the uh, vdi infrastructure i'll do a little bit of the intro for that and i'll turn it over to chris to do some more of the higher technical details as he was more involved in the setup of the blade center itself and then i'll finish up with some of the things the concerns we found etc uh, in case uh, others are are trying to set up a similar situation um so let me start a little bit with the backstory. I know Kay went through it, but you know, my colleague Chris and I, uh, we, we all work in different capacities. So I am both uh, work in the technology department with Chris. I'm also a, um, a professor in our applied computing. And I, I had never really uh, been involved in any of this uh, open simulator stuff. And, um, but so we had a new CTO come in and he, uh, He's wonderful and he's committed to doing everything possible for us to use technology to improve the student experience. So when we were looking to do that, he put us in touch with Kay and um, she told us of the things she was doing in, in with the uh, open simulator software stuff. And uh, we also had a Horizon Blade Center, which is uh, what we're using uh, to virtualize the machines that have the viewers on them. And he's allowing us to use those things to better enhance the student experience. Um, so uh, to, as long as you know, it's a teaching capacity for the students, et cetera. So, so anyway, so the first scenario is that, um, you know, students were using um, the open simulators on campus, but like Kay said, uh, many times it was their own devices. So, um, you know, sometimes if, if they were off campus, their devices may not be good enough. Uh, their machines may not meet the correct hardware requirements to run it. Uh, like Kay also mentioned, you know, maybe they're um, they're you know scared about downloading the right things. You don't want viruses or anything, so you know it's potentially uh, they weren't sure of which one to get. Um, we also, from a uh, administrator or a college standpoint, we didn't have the uh, ability really to centrally manage when when people were bringing their own devices, especially if they're off campus in other states, other countries, et cetera. So it was harder for us to manage. So we had a bunch of different uh, scenarios of what we were trying to all solve to better improve the student experience. So, so I mean, really, this bring your own device wasn't wasn't the way to go. So we talked to Kay. You can go ahead and advance, Kay. Uh, so we we talked with Kay, and what we kind of came to you know propose was you know one of the things we would do was to host those Windows virtual or host Windows virtual machines on servers in our data center. That way we could control the hardware, make sure they had sufficient hardware uh, that would meet the needs of of these students. Uh, so what we decided to do was use this uh, virtual desktop infrastructure or VDI um, to host these things. So with VDI, we also found we have an extra uh, benefit of adding a security layer through the native VDI session. So those screenshots Kay was showing you of uh, her using the viewers on the mobile devices, 
those things also are similar to a VPN. The, the connection the Horizon client makes is in actually an encrypted session. So we do have an extra layer of protection we're offering to our students using this. Uh, so the best part was, is, you know, using this technology, you know, we can control the student experience, uh, but also, you know, provide more options for our users and students that are off and outside of our campus network. Go ahead and you can advance. All right, Chris, I'll, I'll go ahead and turn it over to you. You can go into some of the uh, some of the details about the infrastructure itself, and then I'll jump back in at the end. Okay, yes, uh, thank you, Jason. Um, good morning, everyone. Um, so I'm just going to go over the uh, infrastructure architecture and sort of how everything is built. Um, like it was mentioned earlier, um, we're using a VMware Horizon. Um, it's a VDI solution offered by VMware. It's pretty widely used. Um, it's fairly robust. And it's got some pretty neat capabilities, which I'm going to get into in a bit. Um, but all of the VDI machines are running on um, vSAN ready nodes, um, which is essentially a, a hyper-converged architecture. Each node has um, four 10 gigabit links all connected to a central switch. Um, so that allows for pretty fast uh, communication um, between the virtual environment. Um, and the VMs are also running on solid state disk storage, uh, which provides pretty, uh, pretty good performance um, for OS uh, operations and you know, so on and so forth. Um, but really, sort of the secret sauce uh, for this architecture is the NVIDIA Tesla M10 GPUs that are in each uh, Horizon server node. Um, that provides enhanced uh, graphics processing, uh, which was sort of a necessity for running um, the OpenSIM viewers. So yes, uh, advance to that slide. This is, um, this is sort of an overview of um, the infrastructure. Um, the screen, the two screenshots here, and uh, yes, that is the uh, NVIDIA grid protocol, um, Frank. Um, but this is a uh, screenshot of our vCenter and as well as uh, in Horizon. Um, it's just a, a handful of virtual machines right now. Um, they're all using uh, the NVIDIA grid, uh, which is sort of a native capability in, um, in Horizon and VMware. Um, so do you want to take it to the next uh, slide, please? Okay. And here's uh, the Horizon Administrator Console. Um, so this is, this sort of facilitates the connection between the end users and the virtual machines um, running on the infrastructure. Um, so if you want to advance to the next slide. So that, that's sort of a, like a high level overview of the environment itself. Um, here is a, essentially how we performed our testing. Uh, we use the Firestorm and Singularity viewers. Um, those seem to be uh, highly recommended and popular. And we install them on Windows 10 virtual machines. Um, and we use the, uh, the long-term stability build, uh, that's LTSB of Windows 10. Um, it seemed to just be a better fit uh, to run in a virtual environment, not just for this, but um, other VDI use cases. And we actually tried without um, using the GPUs. And what we saw was that it was pretty much unusable. Um, even on the local network, um, it just, the video was choppy. It was just wasn't really feasible to use. So we were able to get some, uh, some of the GPUs and we tested with um, various profiles. Um, so each profile allocates a different amount of video memory um, to the virtual machine. So each GPU essentially has 32 gigs of video memory, and the profiles allow you to carve out um, the memory according, you know, however you want to. So we tried it out with uh, one, two, and even four gig uh, profiles. And even going as low as one gig, um, it ran very smoothly. 
and it was um, it was a very good experience. And I'm actually in um, the virtual environment right now. That's how I'm accessing the grid. So, if you could advance, please. Yep, and like I said, it's a uh, Windows 10 LTSB. Um, oh yeah. So um, it's this environment's only available to uh, Tulane students. I'm sorry. <laughs> I see uh, you downloaded Horizon. Um, yes, yes, Kay. So the hardware specs on the VMs. Um, we essentially settled with um, four virtual CPUs, um, eight gigs of RAM, and 80 gigs of uh, hard drive space. Um, so it's fairly a fairly standard virtual desktop, maybe a little higher performing than we're used to. But you know, the Horizon vSAN ready nodes uh, have a ton of resources available. Um, each node has, I think, 768 gigs of RAM. So multiply that by four, and you have a very large number. You know, it's three terabytes of RAM. Um, no, I don't have um, a technical how-to, but we could put something together real quick if, uh, if you're interested. Um, a lot of what I use to sort of build the architecture is, it's really just a standard uh, horizon, um, horizon build. The complexity came with actually setting up the GPUs themselves. Um, it's very vendor specific, and we actually had to have some assistance from Dell uh, to install the GPUs in the servers, as well as um, install the drivers in uh, VMware ESX. But and I can um, somehow get out some of those documents for you if you're interested in building an environment like this. So that said, I'm gonna take it. I'm gonna take it back over to Jason, and uh, you can wrap it up. Thank you. Thanks, Chris. Um, so yeah, Chris went through some of the uh, technical stuff on how we set up the blades in the Blade Center and the VDI machines. So. Um, if anyone is going to try this or, or do some stuff, I, we did also want to include some of the concerns we found uh, when doing this. So, uh, so the first concern and the first problem we ran into is that you know normally in a VMware environment, uh, machines are you know highly available. They're they're floating around. They can be vMotioned on and off, uh, you know, to different hosts. So that way you can you know. You can do things like use, you know, do cluster updates, do, you know, uh, you know, move uh, resources around if, um, you know, a host gets overused, et cetera. And typically all that stuff is set up automatically. Uh, but what we found is that using these GPUs, uh, we're doing like a PCI bus pass through. So um, when you do that, the machines get fixed to where they're not able to be live migrated any longer. So. Uh, so what we've had to do is just turn off all our high availability, our DRS, et cetera. And uh, we have to, if we need to move these machines around, uh, we just have to turn them off and manually move them. Um, so another thing we have to do is, um, you know, because of this, typically we, we don't want to have all the user machines on one static node. So we do have GPU cards installed on each node. And what we've done is we've, you know, sprinkled the, the virtual machines around on different nodes. We have two or three per host. So uh, that gives us some additional protection, you know, in case of loss of service on a host, uh, we may only lose, you know, a fourth uh, of the machines. Uh, the next concern is that typically, you know, in a virtual environment, uh, you you are able to over allocate you know RAM and uh, storage and stuff. But with using these GPUs, you have to reserve fully all the RAM um, you are going to use. So if if you are going to purchase one of these things, make sure you you do have enough to you know uh, like an over allocation of RAM because uh, these these machines you have to reserve it all up front. Um, so and I guess the last one is that, you know, also typically in a VMware environment, as a server administrator, you can right click on a machine, you can get into the console, you can, 
you know, if you need to access something, check on a, a machine or uh, assist a user uh, that, that may be on there. Uh, but these GPUs use the same protocol, that BLAST protocol we're using, um, as the console does. So once we turn this on, um, our only option really is uh, either an RDP, just a remote desktop session, into the machines. Uh, so if we have to go in there and say if there's a new version of Firestorm that comes out, then we have to go in there RDP to access these things. Or or there is some built-in uh, stuff, some assistance in the horizon uh, that we can use. Um, so you can go ahead and advance, K. So then one of our last thing, let me also talk about, because I started off with the, you know, how we started the project and how, how it came to be. Then we ran into some concerns. So let me also then talk about a little bit of what we did to testing where we get, got it over to K. So uh, what we did first, you know, we we had our infrastructure functioning. Chris, Chris and I got that set up, mostly Chris. He's the technical one out of us. Uh, and then we started on our on-campus testing because, of course, the you know, your network is going to be better probably on-campus than off-campus. So we started with just basic testing our technology staff, you know, Chris and I, and we tested some Windows desktops, uh, some laptops, some older laptops, and everything we tried it on, we had great success. Uh, another nice thing that we I wanted to mention in here and throw in, we're starting to move our lab environments and, and we're doing some testing around campus with these WISE terminals. They're a cheaper, um, you know, a cheaper a way to, you know, to, uh, run desktops but we were scared because the the resources on these things are a lot uh, a, a lot less it's almost like a mobile device or even like a raspberry pi type device it's this small terminal and it's running this thing called thin os so we use those to connect to or and had, they had the horizon client on it we use those to connect to these machines and we had great success so we also then tried to start uh, off campus uh testing because of course that was one of Kay's requirements that she has students that maybe not in state or not on campus or you know around the world so we we wanted to go ahead and test that we've tested from home from different locations all successes we then turned it over to Kay and some of our other staff and she was really the one who uh, tried out the the world and the, the viewers on her iPhone or iPads we also have tried it on some Android devices and found out that these were great successes too. So uh, that's kind of what led us here because the, well, we she really thought it was amazing that it, it would run on the, you know an old iPad, and uh, that's a really great thing. A lot of you know our university we do have older you know uh, stuff that we recycle and stuff. So hey, maybe this is a way we can repurpose and use some of these devices. Um, all right, Kay, you can go on one more last slide. Right, okay. One more slide. Yep. So in the last one we have here, just to kind of finish it up. Uh, so our access control. So I did see something in the chat that uh, somebody had asked Chris, well, how do I access it? You know, what's the address? So our last concern was, of course, how do we control access? Because we don't have the resources to allow every student that, you know, uh, in our whole university to to access this at the same time. Now, if, if if that came to be, you know, great, you know, maybe we would be able to uh, get more resources, more horizon nodes, more servers. But uh, so we did need a way to control access. So uh, using this the horizon software, uh, we actually were able to use Active Directory security groups to access these machines. So once we had Active Directory security groups assigned to our desktop pool of machines, we then could also use our in-house um, identity management software to delegate control of these uh, security groups to our instructors. So if Kay has a class she, she wants to teach, she can have a web interface to uh, add remove the students she needs access to and then take them away when the semester's over or when users are, are not using them. So this allows us to control access. Uh, this also allows uh, outside users like, like we have in here, even if we did post the address, uh, they would not be able to to get into the collection and use them unless an instructor or a professor, um, you know, gives the students the access they need to these machines. So uh, that's great because that, that way, you know, we still have our, we still have centralized control and management of them from uh, the technical side on our server side, but we can delegate everything to the professors who know how the software is being used and who needs access to them. And, uh, and I guess that, that is it. So, uh, 
There's a few questions, Jason and Chris. Sure. Yeah, we'd be happy to answer questions. Uh, Selby asks, do you have an estimate of the cost per user? Now connected to Christy's iPhone. Um, I don't. I was not available uh, or uh, in any of the budgeting scenario when they purchased this. Uh, maybe we can work something up and try to figure out because we are using this in other environments. We support the horizon. We support other lab uh, environments and things around our campus. So uh, I'll try to find the original budget of you know what the GPUs especially cost because that was something we more purchased for this use. Uh, and then on a, you know the blade center itself and um, but probably unless you had a very large user base the that we're going to use this the cost is probably not going to be um, probative to you know just for you know a handful of students uh, but we for our GPUs we we found other things like uh, AutoCAD and things we're, we're doing with this so we were able to justify the cost and like I said our new CTO is wonderful and doing everything he can to to support the student experience. So he was happy to do this, but uh, I'll, I'll see if we can get something together uh, and uh, at least get an estimate so you know how how, how bad it is. <laughs> yeah, and just uh, sort of to follow up on that, Jason, um, the GPUs do add a, a cost per user. And like you said, we don't have the exact numbers, but we can't include, a, uh, we can't carve out GPUs for every virtual machine. So it's sort of an extra feature that would increase costs. Um, so just to add that in there. Uh, Lisa asks, it seems like this is the same as Frame or Bright Canopy is doing. Is that correct? If not, how is it different? Um, I, I have to admit I'm not familiar with the Frame or Bright Canopy. Uh, I'm um, not either, so, I, so I'm, I'm not sure. <laughs> Uh, uh, Shelby put something in the chat, but um, uh, the new price, 10 hours uh, for uh, $17 a month. Um, I'm, you know, I, I'm uh, just uh, taking a guess here. I'll bet that, that that's what uh, Bright Canopy is doing is virtualizing the viewers. I would bet also when, when Chris and I started looking at this, we looked around and didn't see too many people doing anything like this. Um, I did see some people trying to use some type of Citrix product uh, for this, uh, as well as one or two with Horizon. So I would guess it's either Citrix or Horizon um, that they're doing this with. And uh, it, it's, I'm sure, a similar setup. Um. Are the, let's see, I'm looking, but Bright Canopy, uh, uh, Joyce adds, but Bright Canopy is a marketed service to others as opposed to this being an in-house scenario. Uh, yes, you are right. And uh, Krista, Krista, uh, Jason, and Chris, you haven't met, is a computer science professor at the University of California, Irvine. And she's also one of the core developers of OpenSim, as well as the um, or creator of the Hypergrid. And Krista adds, the technology is wonderful. It just seems a bit expensive at the moment. Um, yeah, thank you. Very nice to meet you. Yeah, yeah, it is expensive. If if, if we didn't have other uses for this as well, it, it, it would have probably been tough to justify this, but, um, you know, I, I think it's well worth it. Uh, I mean, from what I've seen, from from what Kay's doing with it, I would I would love actually. So I teach in the applied computing. <laughs> I would love to figure out some way to uh, to, to incorporate this into my classes because when I was a student, I would have loved to do something like this for classes. <laughs> and and as you said, uh, Jason and Chris, that it may be a way to repurpose um, old equipment. Um, I'm constantly over at our surplus depot looking for furniture and equipment, and it may save money in the long run. And I wonder about uh, centralizing the different computer labs too, as opposed to having you know uh, 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 so many desktop units. I wonder if there might be some cost savings there, but I'm just guessing here. Um, okay. Um, yeah, so there, there is a, definitely a, a cost saving on the end user devices. 
Um, and like Jason said, we, we use a horizon in other parts of uh, the university. Um, like a, the business school actually has a virtual lab that students access from anywhere. Um, and also, I, I took a quick peek at um, the Bright Canopy site. And just looking at the FAQs, it sounds like they're using a very similar architecture that we are. Um, just reading uh, one of them, how does this work? We run a viewer on a cloud machine with a hefty graphics card. Um, so it does sound like it runs on a virtual machine um, with a, some sort of a GPU. Um, but I, I can't attest to you know, what the cost, uh, you know, the cost difference would be. But we do have the benefit of controlling the entire environment within our, within our infrastructure as opposed to a, a paid subscription service. So... You know, the the idea of like 10 hours for $17 is daunting to me because um, I would, it would be so stressful to have to get what I need to get done in the virtual world, uh, you know, in, in short order. It's kind of like the old days where long distance calls cost money. Um, so we've got some uh, more comments in the chat about uh, frame virtualized applications like CAD and CAM. And any cloud that needs that it needs rendering in the cloud, and Ramesh, and Ramesh um, is uh, the originator of uh, some uh, build technology to help uh, you know devices that will build uh, up uh, both regions and you know the um, content in the region. And Ramesh adds, Bright Canopy is a bit expensive, but it's great to be able to catch, to test our touch UI to an open SIM environment on a mobile platform. Um, and let's see. Uh, and Joyce adds, and they're utilizing uh, their already in place infrastructure. Yes, uh, we are. Any more last questions? And um, I've got my last uh, uh, script remarks here. Um, thank you, Jason and Chris, uh, for a terrific presentation. Mm -hmm.